All right, we're up to section 4.2, which starts on page 142. And on there, the ne on the next two or three pages, they talk about the three different types of graphics. This will be on your written test. You'll have to be able to distinguish between them. The first one are GIFs. GIF is an acronym that stands for Graphic Interchange Format. All right. GIFs are typically used for very simple types of things. In other words, GIFs aren't used for photographs. They're used for things like logos, you know, fairly simplistic types of logos, that kind of thing. All right. So it says GIF images are best used for line drawings. The maximum number of colors you can use for a GIF is 256. GIFs have a file extension of .gif. They support image transparency. Can you tell the difference between this? That's transparent, that's not. All right, the, the opposite of transparent is what's called opaque. Okay, and we'll see opaque a little bit later. GIFs can also be used for simple animation. All right, so if I had some real crude line art where somebody was walking across the screen, I could do that with GIFs. All right. GIFs also have, on the top of the next page here, this, I'm sure this is on your test in some place or other, they have what's called lossless compression. What that means is when you save a GIF, you know, when, when, when you save a, an image that's not a GIF, a lot of times what happens is it has what's called if you have lossless comp compression, you also have what's called lossy compression. When you save a GIF, pretty much, even if you go and change the size on it or whatever, it's not going to change real much as far as the size of the file. All right? So nothing in the original image is lost when you try to compress it, make it smaller, etc. All right? So it has lossless compression. They mention here that graphic files should be optimized for the web. You may or may not be aware of this. I may or may not have told you this earlier. I have no idea. But most users will wait up to about five seconds when they try to load a web page. And if the web page hasn't loaded in that amount of time, they'll typically leave. Well, if I'm a company and if I make my, my living by having people go out to my website, and have them buy products off my website, I want to make sure that site will load as fast as possible. It should make sense. And there's probably also a good chance that my website will have images on it. So I want those images to be optimized so that they will load as quick as they possibly can. So they, call, they, they define image optimization, optimization here as the process of creating an image with the lowest file size possible that will still give you good image quality. So sometimes you will you know, make an image smaller or whatever because it'll load faster, okay? All right. The next thing they talk about is interlacing. You may have seen this, you may not have. If you've ever gone out to a website that has a very intricate graphic in it, what you might see when, when the site starts loading is it almost looks like a ghost image or like a shadow that you see and then the image eventually comes in, that's interlacing. So when you've got a really complex image that can't load right away, a lot of times what you'll do is you'll show the user kind of a box that the image will load in so that they know something is happening. All right, you may or may not be aware of this, but for years, Microsoft had this. where it looked like a little timer and Microsoft, it would like twirl around. I would watch people, and I'm not making this up, sit there for a half an hour by their, you know, and, and they were waiting for something to happen on the screen. I said, what are you waiting for? Well, that timer's still going, so it's not done yet. No, if the timer's still going and it's been more than two or three minutes, chances are your machine is hung and it's not gonna do anything, all right? But the point is, when you do, and you have these interlaced images, a lot of times people will wait because they know something is loading because they can see, oh, it's going to load right here. So they're willing to wait a little bit. The next type. So we had GIF, all right, graphic interchange format. The next type are JPEGs. JPEG, Joint Photographic Expert Group. I don't think you're asked on the test, 
what the, the acronyms mean. If you are, I'll let you know tomorrow. All right, I'll go back and I, I, I'm writing the, uh, your, your sheets, your review sheets the night before. All right. So JPEGs are used for photographs. Unlike GIFs, which we just looked at, that have a maximum of 256 colors, JPEGs can have up to 16.7 million. All right. They cannot be made transparent. They cannot be used for animation. JPEGs sometimes have a .gp, .jpg extension, sometimes a .jpeg extension. Why? I don't know. Okay. No, there is no difference. JPEG images are, have a lossy compression. That means that when you save them and try to optimize them, a lot of times the colors, they'll look a little bit bleached out because as you start saving them to optimize them when they get smaller, then if you have maybe, really believe it or not, three or 400 different colors in there, it might knock it down to 20 or 30 colors. So it's going to look more bleached out is the way they typically refer to it. So as it says, there are trade-offs here between the quality of an image and the amount of compression. So the more you compress the image, typically the quality will suffer. The less you compress an image, the quality will be better. Hopefully that makes sense to you. And if it doesn't, you might want to take a read, again, uh, that what's, what's in the book here on the bottom of page 143 and the top of page 144. All right? Another thing that you should be aware of, as they talk about on the top of the next page, does everybody, know, I, again, I, I'm not trying to, to insult you, but does everybody know what a thumbnail image is? All right. I know that for a while, um, it, it's funny when I tell you this, and I used to go out to this bar, I don't drink, but I karaoke. So I would go out, I would go out to this bar that, uh, that was out near Janesville, Wisconsin, that a friend of mine worked at. And they'd take 100 pictures that night of all the people singing. And they would put them on their site the next day, but they'd be real little thumbnails like this, and you could click on any of the thumbnails, and boom, it would show you the big image. Why am I telling you that? Because you'll need to know for your next test what a thumbnail is. All right? So they say here, Another technique used with web graphics to display a small version of an image called the thumbnail. All right. All right. Notice it says not only are there JPEGs, but there are what are called progressive JPEGs. Progressive JPEGs are similar to an interlaced GIF, all right, but it seems to fade in as it downloads. So in, in other words, it's very similar to that interlacing we talked about with GIFs, but it's a little purer in the way that it looks. All right, so we've talked a little bit about GIFs, a little bit about JPEGs. The third type are pings. All right. Ping is sort of, it's, it's designed to combine the best of GIFs and JPEGs. I'm going to give you something you, you, you'll never be tested on it. You probably don't care about but if I, and I think I'm telling you this in the right order. First, there were just GIFs. That was it. All right. And websites look kind of crummy because they were just GIFs. Then they came up with JPEGs. To my knowledge, I think I'm telling you it the right way. JPEGs are actually, the JPEG is something that's actually owned by HP. They actually have copyrighted, trademarked it or whatever. And the idea was you weren't supposed to be able to use JPEGs anymore. All right, they were going to make it illegal because HP wasn't going to allow people to do that. Gee, that's going to be real easy to make the billions of JPEGs that are out there go away. It isn't going to happen. But the idea when pings were created, they were created so that if that ever did happen, you would be able to use basically the same kind of format because typically pings and JPEGs look very similar. You'll notice in here, okay, they do allow transparency where JPEGs don't. This is lossy, this is lossless. So again, that's the best because it's GIF-like. They allow for millions of colors and they allow for interlacing. So they are, the idea behind a ping is it's the best of all worlds. Pings have, you know, portable network graphic have a .png. I will tell you this, this you won't see in a book, all right? Because people always ask, well, you know what? 
if pings are better than JPEGs, can I, I've, got this, I've got this picture of my dog. That's dog.jpg. Could I just save that as dog.ping and now I can do good stuff with it? And the answer is technically yes, but it won't work typically the way you want it to work. If you want to, if you want to convert a JPEG to a ping or vice versa, just Google free JPEG to ping converters. There are free ones online. That will do it for you. Don't just change the extension. Because the next step, I've seen people do that. Well, I'm going to take my, my GIF file and I'm going to save it with a .jpg extension. Now I can have millions of colors on it. It'll probably not work the way you want. But a lot of times you can go from one format to the other with free converters that you can find by just looking online. All right. The other thing too, and you may, again, you may never have to use this, but I like to show this to people. Again, so I'm going to come in here. I'm, I'm, I'm having my students do this thing where they, they have to literally use this graphic right here. All right. And is that that big a thing? No, but I want to show you something just so you can see this. All right. And that is, I'm going to go out to Google and I'm going to go out to Google Images. And as an example, I'm going to, they're doing a guessing game program. So I'm going to type guessing game in here. And let's, there it is. So I'm going to right mouse click, choose save image as, and I'm going to save it to my um, desktop as guessing game. Okay, just, just so you see this, all right? And literally what I'm going to show you will take just a matter of minutes, hopefully, if I don't screw it up. But, well, I, I've saved it twice, but here it is, is GG. So there it is. Everybody sees it? Okay, so now I'm going to come out there and I'm going to go to, I decide that's too big. So I'm going to go out to makeathumbnail.com, which is a free site. And I want it to be 100 by 100. So what file? I have to choose, I go over to my desktop and I find that GG file, there it is. And I tell it I want it to be 100 by 100. I click make a thumbnail and it saves it out to the internet for me. All right, now I can go out to that on the internet here, type in that address. Now it's a lot smaller. All right, I can right mouse click. And what I always do when I do a save image as, I'll save it as GG again, but I save it as GG-TN for thumbnail. So if you ever have to make a thumbnail, that's a free tool you can use. That's the good news. The bad news is it only offers like four sizes. 100 by 100, 150 by 150, 200 by 200, I guess five sizes, 250 by 250, and 300 by 300. They don't, it doesn't allow you to go and put in your own custom size. There are other tools that do. This is the easiest one I have ever worked with. Question. Um, so even if you're saving from a website and yours was or that one was PNG and you would choose to save that type uh, JPEG, it wouldn't convert it. It would convert it. But I, what I'm saying is there's no guarantee that it's always going to work when you do that by just saving the extension. But again, if you go out here and you type in, for example, free JPEG to... to uh, ping converter. Notice it's already found a bunch. All right. So you can go out there. There you go. JPEG to ping. And there might even be a ping to JPEG. I don't know. All right. But you go out there and that's what you should use. It's not going to, you know, you, you, you literally just go in there and you tell it the one you want, etc. It's, it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory once you've, you've done a little bit of work with it. They're really not hard to use. And which one would you recommend to use? Most people use pings whenever they can, just because, again, you can, you can interlace them. They, they, they Just like you can do colors with them, you can do a certain amount of um, um, animation with them. They offer, like I said, the best of both worlds, and that's what they're showing on the chart here. All right. Now, Google also has a brand new format that's called WebP image format that offers basically everything that's available. Now it says here it's not yet ready for commercial use. My guess is it probably is now because this book actually came out in late 2015. So if you're interested in that, you can go look, look that up. All right. I don't think that's on your test at all. If for some reason it is, I will, I will tell it to you. Okay. All right. So let's suppose, and I'm going back here, 
to what I'd shown you earlier. So I'm, I'm back here. Remember this thing? Right here. Remember that? Okay. I want to come back in here, and I want to put in that, that uh, image, that thumbnail that I just put in. You all with me? So I want to do that. All right. I don't want to put it in the div. I'm just going to put it out there by itself. So I'll, I'll put a paragraph in here. I don't have to put it. In fact, I don't even need it as a paragraph. At a minimum, I should say image, and I should say width. Remember, I saved that as whoop, I save that as 100 by 100. So at a minimum, I should say width equals 100, height equals 100. All right. Source equals, and it's it's on my. Uh, where is this? I better take this file and I, I have to save it well let's see I have to give it the path to the to my uh, to my desktop I which I have no idea what the hell that is that C colon users desktop like that without that slash slash um, I think it was GG dash tn dot ping I believe it was we'll find out in a minute and finally I'm going to put in here alt equals guessing game image all right let's see if I did it right or not see it okay now that wasn't meant to just totally amaze you but what I want to do is I want to show you the different components of an image tag the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to purposely make a mistake in here. Everybody hear that? So instead of calling this GG, I'm going to put a 1 in there. That's incorrect. I purposely did it incorrectly. See where this says guessing game image? Watch what happens now. See that? The alt tag puts in some text if you give it a non-existent file or a file with the wrong path or whatever. Also, what the alt tag does is it helps people who cannot see. All right? So the alt tag is used by browsers for the blind. And it will say there is an image, there is a guessing game image here. Now, that wouldn't help them much, but hopefully you get the idea. All right? Now, this, well, this isn't what you asked, but I want to mention something else in here. So I'm going to go back and change it to the way it was. Because people will ask me this. Can I go in here and just like make that 300 and make that 300 even though I saved it as 100 by 100? And what's the answer? The answer is yes, but it'll typically end up looking like that. See how it's out of focus? All right. So you typically don't want to do that. And you can distort this too. And what I mean is I could leave this one 100, I could leave the width at 100 and put the height at 300, all right, and then bring that up. And again, it's going to look distorted, okay? Now, there are different ways. So let's suppose in here I was back here at my, so here's the guessing game image, and somewhere in here is also the thumbnail. There it is, okay? Sometimes if you just take your mouse and you put it over it, It'll show you the dimensions, okay? And it's got there, for example, that this one is 282 by 179. So that really is the size, all right? This isn't the thumbnail. That's the thumbnail right, whoop, that's the thumbnail right there. Notice if I put it over that, it says 100 by 63. So that's, even though I told it to save it as 100 by 100, it's scaled. So originally, if you notice here, the height, I'm sorry, the width, it's always width by height. The 283 is bigger than the 179. So when I told it to scale at 100 by 100, it tried. But to scale, really, that should, what I should have put here is instead of 100, 100, which is what I had, I should have put 163. All right, because that's the true size of it. It was close enough that even though I put it like that, you couldn't tell the difference. All right? But when you put an image tag in, you'll typically put in a width. You'll typically put in a height. 
you must put in a source because that's the file with the image in it. And guidelines today for disability, et cetera, says you will also put an alt tag in. So at a minimum, always put in a source tag and an alt tag. Now, what if I didn't want to put these in? Okay, what if I just left them out? So I'm going to put them in, put this in like this. Okay, and I'm going to bring this back up again. And believe it or not, it still looks just fine. But it's considered good practice to put that in. So sometimes what people do instead is they come in here into their style and they'll say that image, if I only have one, all right. So I come in here and now I don't say with equal and height equals, I say with colon, colon, 100 pixels, height, colon, 63 pixels. So there's different ways you can put this stuff in here. So if I save this now, I guess it is saved, and I bring it back up, notice it's still in there. All right. Sometimes, I just, this is what I'm trying to, I'm spending a long time telling you this, but sometimes you click on it, and you put your mouse over it, and it doesn't show the dimensions. You just can't have, for whatever reason, but sometimes with an image, it won't show the dimensions like it is here. All right, so what can you do? Well, there's a couple things. You can right mouse click on it, and you can say open with, where is it? Well, you, I'd look for an open with, and I can't find it, but you can open it inside of paint, and that's just really a crummy way of doing it. But if for some reason you're trying to get the dimensions of your, um, of your image, and it just won't show for whatever reason, it just won't, you try everything, hey, I can't figure out these darn dimensions, then what you can do, and this is the one of the few times I will say that if you bring up, bring this up, all right, if you bring up your image and you bring it up inside of, if you open it with Internet Explorer, I know that sounds weird, and you right mouse click on it, you go to properties, it will show you the size. The only reason I tell you that is sometimes that happens. And that's been the only way I could figure out on a few occasions how to get the dimensions of it. Okay, yes. Yeah, whenever I was looking at this stuff the other day, you can just right click it and then go to properties on your desktop. And it that's it, you are supposed to be able to. Sometimes that stuff doesn't work, especially when you're using older versions of Windows and the like. All right? But you're right, they're trying to make it simpler and simpler for you all the time. All right, the idea is you want to make it almost impossible for somebody to screw it up. All right, so I showed you the source. Here are those attributes. You can put borders around, around your images. You can put IDs with your images and names and titles, etc. I do want to show you one that's kind of important here. Where is it? This title, it says a text phrase containing advisory information, typically more descriptive. If you are creating a website, and that website is going to be, especially if it's going to be used, let's say for the government, it's some kind of a public website that everyone could use. You, the ADA, the American Disabilities Act, may mandate that you put something in here for a title. That would be a long description for someone who cannot see. The tough thing, and I've heard this before, okay, I want to describe this thing. So I want to describe what we just looked at before. So what I want to do is I want to describe this. And I want to say it's a purple dinosaur. And what's the problem with that? If someone has been blind from birth, purple probably doesn't mean anything to them. And dinosaur may or may not mean anything to them. There is a real art to being able to write descriptions for people who cannot see. There really and truly is. All right. Now, some of the stuff that's in here, they'll say they're marked obsolete. What that means is you really shouldn't be using them anymore, like the border. You should use the CSS border instead. All right. I just went over the accessibility thing with you. I don't think it pays to talk about that anymore. I would strongly suggest if you want to become better at using images, 
that you would go through, there is a hands-on practice in your book, that you go through that hands-on practice. All right? I mean, again, I can sit there and say, you know what, I'm going to just require that you do the hands-on practices for every chapter. But what that's going to do is with some of you, you're already saying, geez, I don't have enough time. I work full time. I got a family. I got this. I got that. I don't have time anyway. All right. I don't want it where you're falling behind. But I will tell you, especially if you're running into any problems in here where you need help with anything, a good place to start is to go in and do the practice exercises, the ones that are throughout the chapter, the hands-on practice. It won't make you an expert. But then when you see it on a test, it'll be, oh, I already did this. That'll make it much easier for you. All right. You can make a hyperlink, an image hyperlink. So you can take an image. So notice that inside of that href, we have put an image tag. All right. So if I wanted, for example, again, just to show you this, I'm going to come in here. I won't use that one because I don't like that image. But I'm going to just come in here. And let me close a bunch of this because this is way, way too many things open. All right, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to go to Google. And in Google, I'm going to go to Google Images. I just want to show you how this is oft times used. Rankin Technical College logo. There we go. Let's grab one of those. This one will work. Right mouse click, save image as. I'll again save it to desktop and I'll just type in rank and logo, logo.ping. All right. So I'm going to go back to the same website we were just at here. And under this image tag, I'm going to copy all this because just to make my life easier. Let's put in a, a, a line break or two. And I'm going to say here, a href equals. I'm going to use their syntax. Okay. HTTP colon slash slash www dot rankin dot edu. We've done this before, but then we've always used text here. Now I'm going to use an image. All right. And I'm going to say desktop. Rankin logo dot ping alt equal and we'll just say here Rankin logo all right and uh, that should be all we need I believe so there's the Rankin logo notice if I put my mouse over it I, I immediately there I don't get the pointer there I get the pointer and waiting it's going to open up Rankin's website so again on the bottom of, of page 147 in your book and the top of page 148 in the book they show you in there how you can create in a hyperlink with an image you will do that for your next written test it'll be on there all right sometimes people like the dog here or just put a little fold by their pages if I say that's going to be on the test all right you might want to go and do the hands-on practice on 148, 149. Yes, sir. Uh, why does it look like the dimensions are off? The dimensions look like they're off because technically, if you look at it when I saved it, even though it said 200 by 200 on the screen, when I saved it, where is the ranking? There it is. Again, if I put my mouse over it and choose properties, notice it's, it's not that size. Now, here it doesn't show that. But it's not 200 by 200. It saved it as a different size. All right, that's why it looks a little bit off, because it is. All right. So again, the hands-on practice four, three, and four, four. You want to go over those? Hey, it's going to do nothing but help. Again, there's an FAQ. What if my images don't display on page 149? First thing to do is make sure that you've got it where you think you do. What we're going to end up doing in our websites, I guarantee you, you will do this for your next written test. You will create a folder. Last time you created a folder called CSS, you will have one of those on your next test, but you will also have a folder called Images. You will put your images in there. Then you'll have to make sure that you are referring to the Images folder, all right, when you're giving the source equal. So that's the first thing, is to make sure you've done that. 
Second, make sure you spelled it correctly. All right. You may or may not have noticed, but when I first put it in, instead of rank and logo, I typed in rank and log. I forgot the O on the end. People do it. All right. That stuff, all of it, just so you know, all of that stuff is going to be case insensitive. So even if I saved it as rank and logo all in caps and I refer to it as rank and logo all in lowercase, it'll work just fine. All right. Or any derivation of that. All right. They talk next about the visual elements. This is not wrapping up or with a, well with a book. All right. But in your book on the visual elements, okay, they show you the hands-on practice if you want to do that on 4-5. The thing to notice is not is first look at the, this is the picture that's on 150 in your book and look at the next picture. Hopefully you can tell the difference. The second one has this. This is the caption. The idea is one of the new H5, HTML5 tags is the figure tag. They show you how to use the figure tag in here. If you turn up in your book to page 152, they show you how to use the figure tag. All right. So if you look, this is how you would style it, but this is the key part here. So inside of a figure tag, you put your image, all right? After that, you put your caption. By convention, the caption appears down below. I believe you can also put it up above. But by convention, it always appears down below. So take a look at that. You will be required on your next test to do this. You will have to put in a figure element. I guarantee it will be on there, all right? Next in your book on 153. They talk about the meter element and they talk about the progress element. All right, here's an example of the meter element. So they're saying we had to our, to our uh, website, we, this month we had 14,417 visits. 7,000 of them were from Firefox, 3,800 were from IE, 2,000 some from Chrome, 1,000 some from Safari, etc. All right, so the green things that are in there, those are the progress elements. All right, going along with that, in fact, that's the meter. The progress element is this the progress is how far you've come. Maybe you've seen that before you go out to a website and the website is doing a fundraiser. A good example of this, you know, J.J. Watt has been trying to, to uh, get money for the people from Hurricane Harvey, and I have not gone out to his site, all right? But if you do, let's, let's say that he, now the, let's say his new goal is $25 million, and let's say that he's three-quarters of the way there. Then his progress is going to show three-quarters, all right? That kind of an idea. So the meter element and the progress element, all right, they're both fairly new. They're HTML5 things. Are you going to have it on your next test? If you do, I'll let you know before you take the test. I don't remember if it's on there or not. All right. But they show you how you can create the associated meter element for the picture on page 153. This picture here, they show that in your book on the middle of page uh, 153. And for the progress thing, they show you the code on the bottom of 153. All right? Okay. Next, background images. You've done this before. Body, background color. That changes just the color. But if instead of color, you want an image, you can do that. All right? And there's a few things about this that are really important. All right. This says background image URL texture one dot pink. A few things to realize. First of all, it's background hyphen image, colon, then you put the URL in there. In other words, that's the name of the file that you want to, dis you want to be showing as your background image. So you always say the word URL. If it happens to be an image, images folder, you'll say images slash texture1.ping. Now the important thing, okay? I used to show this to people this way. I bring up a little image. Remember when this was in and you'd see that? And it was that little yellow thing? 
You know what I'm talking about, the little smiley face? And literally the image on your screen, the image was about this big. That's what it looked like, okay? What we're gonna look at in just a minute, and it's on the bottom of page 155, is the repeat option. If you don't tell it a repeat option, it just repeats this as many times as it can. So if I had this on the screen, you might see a hundred of them on the screen and your screen would look butt ugly, all right? But when you go and do this, if it's a very small image, you can tell it to repeat in certain ways. This is shown on the bottom of 155 in your book. Repeat Y means repeat it down the Y axis. Repeat X means repeat it along the, y, the X axis. No repeat means show it once. All right? So there's different ways that you can set this stuff up is what I'm trying to get across to you. All right? You will probably have at least an image on a page where you'll have to use some, some different variation of the repeat process. Does that make sense to people? And if you try doing it and you're like, nothing showing, then where you've got background URL, you've got, you're not pointing to where it actually is. Even if you think you are, you're not. Or you spell the file name wrong. It's got to be one of, one of those things or the other. All right, so if you want more, read yourselves. But I would strongly suggest you take a look at 154 and 155. And if you're still confused, do the hands-on practice that's on pages 156 and 157. Like I said, these hands-on practices are just designed to give you more experience using this stuff. FAQ page on page 157. What if my images are in their own folder and it's what I told you? Then when you use that, you'll have to say images dash or slash or wherever it is. All right? Okay. Background position property, we talked about that already. All right? You can also position things at the top, bottom, left, and right. So top's going to be here. Everybody, if you didn't hear this before, remember back in the days when you had to do graphs? All right? You know, when you had an x-axis. and What did you call this? Does anybody remember? That's the origin. The origin here is right there. That's zero, zero on a web page. It's in the upper left corner. That means you're zero, zero pixels to the right and zero pixels down. All right? But they show you here, if you know, if, if you've got an images folder, how you'll have to say images slash or whatever. Background attachment. It says it can, you can configure whether the image remains fixed in place or it scrolls within a page. Why is that important? If this was maybe my logo and I wanted it to always stay there, even while I scroll up the screen, I could do that by using that background attachment property. All right? All right. Image maps. You may have seen this before. I'll just show you the one that typically is the easiest for people to identify with. All right, if I highlight a state and click on it, it brings up that state's page, okay? Another one that, that is used, very commonly used is the human body. If you've ever gone out, there are websites that are out there for like people who are studying to become doctors and they've got a picture like of a skeleton and they've got the different parts of the leg or whatever and you can put your mouse over different parts and it'll give you information about those. Take your question a second. Does the concept make sense to people? All right, and I'll take your question, but I want to mention, typically when you set this up, the only images that you have available to you are like a circle, which isn't what this is, a square, which isn't what this is, or what's called a polygon, where you can kind of draw your own shape. So if you've got stuff with very different shapes, you'll be using the polygon, yes. So my guess is there's some kind of a plotting program that once they drew this, it gives you coordinates okay. for you, and that's how they did it. And then they created the yeah. yeah. 
All right, so if you want more about images, it's on 158, 159, and 160. Okay? And again, there is a, it's not exactly a hands on here, but you can take a look at what's there. All right, are you going to have to do an image map? I don't believe there's one on your next text, test. Rather, Again, if there is, the day before we take the test, I'll let you know what's going to be on it. All right, this isn't meant to be a, a lot of surprises for you. All right, on 160 and 161, I don't know why they use this um, designation, but they do. This is never called a favorites icon. It's always called a favicon. It just is. Okay? Please look up on the screen here. If I go out to here, and I'm going to show you this. They're, all, they're already on here anyway, but I'm going to go out to www.rankin.edu. Okay? Would you agree when I go out to Rankin, you see the little R right there? You see that up, and up, up here? Everybody see this? That's the favicon for Rankin. That's what a favicon is. You may have to build a favicon for your next one, and typically all you do is you just, you know, there are, you can literally use software to do it, or you can go out and find something. But when you do it, the key thing is you don't want this to be really big. It's typically saved, I think it's 20 by 20, but they, they should say it in here someplace. Let's see. They even tell you how you can create your own icons, favicons, on the bottom of page 161. But I, like I said, I believe the size you should use for them is around 20 pixels wide by 20 pixels high. They're not going to be big. It says 16 by 16. 16 by 16. Okay, thank you. All right. But they shouldn't be really any bigger than that. Why? Because they're displaying right here. You couldn't make it 100 by 100 because it would... You know, it would be taking up too much screen space if you did that. All right. Is it possible to do that now? Is it? Yes, you can. I've seen people, you know, every time somebody says, you know, can you do something and somebody says you can't, somebody goes out and proves, proves that yes, you can. Whether you should or not is another issue, but image slicing, again, I'll let you know, but that might be one that's on your written test. This is on page 162. It says, by image slicing, the single, a single complex image can be cut into smaller images that are optimized. And if that confuses you, what people used to do when they had a really large, intricate image that would take a long time to load, they would take that image and put different pieces of it in a table. So it was kind of like a puzzle, all right? And then when you put the puzzle pieces together, it would look like the image, but it would load faster that way. So that's what they're talking about with image slicing. Sprites, these are important. Sprites are typically when you go and you save a bunch of real little um, images as you know in one file. In the example that they use in the book here, it's going to be a little later on. I don't think it's in this chapter, but they will you will see sprites in a later chapter. All right, but just know that a sprite is an image file that contains multiple small graphics. That's all. If you know that, you should be fine. All right. Sources for graphics. First of all, we've talked about this before, that you can't just go out. I can't do this. I'm not going to, but let's assume that I go out to here. All right. And I, wow, that's a great picture. All right, so I right mouse click, I do a, do a view page source, and I find it. In fact, I might have to look a little bit to find that picture, but I want to show you a very fast way that I can find it. All right, if I click on the picture here, and I hit my F12 button, well, what the heck is that? All right, I brought up what are called the Chrome developer tools. And now if I click on, you know, something in here or whatever, it shows me right where this stuff is. So I could go grab it, but don't go out to anybody else's website and grab their images and put them on your website. Yeah. All right. And I maybe have even given you that story. I still remember that. This was many years ago when, when stuff starting to become 
uh, prevalent on the web. And what people, I, I went out to a website and they had a thing out there where a guy had really cool looking, it looked like uh, fire coming out of, out of uh, like a, out of an exhaust pipe or something. And I thought, well, that looks pretty cool. Within a, within a week, I saw it on three or four other sites. And it was the same one, you could tell. People just copied it. Okay? And I should mention while we're talking about that, just, just this is one of those, just so you're aware of it. Let's see. We put in our portfolio too. And I'm going to put in here just index. Remember this page? All right. This is actually what I'm about to tell you, to my knowledge. Now, you can go out and look it up online, and if, you, if I'm wrong, then let me know I'm wrong. But this is what I have been told. If you copyright your page, even if you haven't saved it or done anything else, if somebody else steals it, you can prove you copyrighted it, it's yours, and you can sue them. You've got that. Well, then what you'd have to do is you'd have, there is software that timestamps what you've worked on. All right. But the reason that that's important is maybe not so much in here, but this has happened where somebody, is, you know, you get somebody who's a songwriter and they don't copyright a page and they put all their stuff out there on the internet. Somebody else steals it and puts it in there as their own work. If it's not copyrighted, technically they didn't steal anything. But if all they put in there was the copyright symbol with their own name or something, then it's copyrighted, and they can sue for damages. You don't have to go to the copyright office? No. That's what I have been told. Now, should you still do that? Of course, you'd want to copyright it. But a lot of times, people will put stuff out there that other people see. Ooh, I like that. All right. And most people, you know, if I'm going to create, put something out there, one of the first things I'll do is put a footer with that in there. And there is no Jeff Scott Inc., but I could quickly create one if I needed to. Or even if I just said, buy Jeff Scott. All right. Probably what I'd say would be like, Jeff Scott, comma, Rankin Technical College. That type of thing. All right, that would protect me. But, I, you know, I've been hit with all this stuff, too, because with my YouTube channel, everything I put out there is public. And I've had people say to me, aren't you afraid of somebody stealing it? Go ahead and steal it, then. I don't care. It's out there for you guys. I'm not trying to make money on it. All right? But if I was, it, I would set it up differently than I do right now. All right, so they do talk to you in the book here, and they mention that there are, you should reuse images whenever you can. Then you don't have to worry about downloading them. When you download a website, just so you know, you may or may not be aware of this, but what happens is, that website gets downloaded into your computer, but in a special part of memory, it gets what's called cached, C-A-C-H-E-D. And what will happen is, if it's in the cache, and then even if you close it, if you try to bring the website up again a couple minutes later, it'll try to bring up the cache version because it comes up faster. Does it always do that? No. If I, bring a, if I save CNN.com right now and I bring it up two hours from now, it's not going to bring up the one I saved two hours before. But you can set it so you, you, and we'll get into that in other classes. We'll talk about things like caching, not in this class, though. Consider size versus quality. We already talked about that. The more lossy it is, the smaller it is, but the worse the quality is. Consider image load time. I already mentioned to you, most people won't wait around for an image to load. All right, they'll think there's something wrong with it, okay, and they'll just go on to another site. Use appropriate resolution. And again, what they're saying in here, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, my wife has got an iPad, all right? But it's probably about a six-year-old iPad. When she looks at stuff and she looks at, and she looks at the same thing on my daughter's iPad, which is about six weeks old, hers is a lot better because the resolution is better. It's improved over time, all right? And that's one of those kind of things, you know, we look before at that guessing game, and you saw when I stretched out that image, that looks pretty amateurish when you do that, all right? And you don't want people to think that when they go to your site, wow, is it all that bad that they just leave? Brightness and contrast, specify dimensions. They say put the right height and width on there whenever possible. Accessibility, we talked a little bit about this. You may or may not be aware of this, approximately 10% 
of the people in the world are colorblind. So, you know, when you, when you put color images in there, they may, they may see very little of it. Not only that, because if, if, people do this, they make the background and the text very similar colors. They're both muted. And if somebody looks at it and they're colorblind, they have a real hard time telling the difference. How do I know that? Because my older brother is colorblind. And I've talked to him before when he's gone out to certain websites. He goes, yeah, the way he always puts it, it's a bitch. He said, I, I have a really hard time telling the difference where one starts and one ends. Always use an alt tag, etc. All right. I think that we're good for another break now. So it's 10.08. Let's go out. Let's just take a short one until 10.20. And then we'll come in and we'll finish this up and go over Chapter 5 as well. But I'm on Section 4-8 on page 165. So we're going to... These are CSS visual effects. This is a good place to stop. That's most of the rest of the chapter, which is about 15 or 20 pages. So we're going to do that. When we get done, we're very quickly going to go over chapter five. All right, after that. So let's take a break, 1020, please. Thank you. Yeah, if you've got your tests and you can drop them back off here, just make sure you do it by the end of the day, please.